So our last speaker for this session is Jason. Uh, the, uh, the title of the paper is Quantifying the Transferability of Features in Deep Neural Networks. And uh, his co-authors are Hot Lipson um, from Cornell University, Jeff Klune, um and Joshua Benzo from University of Montreal. And Jason is going to give the talk. Let's welcome Jason. Thanks. Uh, so, as he mentioned, my name is Jason Yosinski, and I'm going to be telling you today about a study we did um, that helps us peer into the internals of deep neural networks to investigate the representations that they learn. Uh, specifically, we're going to do this by looking at transferability of features within the neural network. So, two years ago, at, at this conference at NIPS, uh, Alex Ilya, who we just heard from, and Jeff Hinton uh, demonstrated successful training of a very large convolutional neural network, or at least very large at the time on the ImageNet data set. Uh, the way they trained this was by presenting images to the network on one end. So for example, here we have an image of a lion. And training gets to predict one of a thousand classes. For example, uh, the lion class, one out of a thousand. Uh, this has revolutionized the field of computer vision for the last few years, uh, leading to a lot of follow-up work. For example, people have combined ConvNets with deformable parts models or uh, used them to find multiple objects with bounding boxes in images. Uh, and more recently, there's been some exciting work on learning joint, joint representations of images and sentences. So we know that these models work. We know that they're pretty powerful, and that's, that's amazing. Um, this this uh, suggests that we should ask the question, what's going on on the insides of these networks? So what do we know so far about what, what's computed by typical convolutional networks trained on images? So one thing a lot of us are kind of familiar with by now is that on the first layer, we end up learning Gabor filters and blobs of color. It seems not to matter too much exactly what data set you use or exactly what task you're training toward, what you're trying to label. Very often, the first layer learns these Gabor filters. All right, what about later layers? So if we look to slightly later layers in the network, um, a common trick for trying to figure out what's going on is to find images or patches of images that happen to cause high activations. And then we can use the methods of Matt Zuther uh, and his deconvolutional networks to highlight the regions of the images that cause those high activations. So for example, here on layer two, we can see we learned uh, one unit learned to find round things or corners. A little bit further up layer five, uh, one unit fires for repeated small, small patterns and a particular type of dog. We can also use numerical optimization techniques. Uh, for example, some published a few days ago by some colleagues and I, um, with or without regularization, to directly find images that cause high activation, which can tell us something about uh, what layers are looking for. There's a complementary approach uh, to all these methods, which is a bit simpler. Um, we can actually just feed images into the network and then plot the activations directly. So I'm going to give you a quick demo of that. In particular, if you can see on the screen here, we have two, uh, two units that are highlighted. This is a left-right edge detector and a right-left edge detector. So keep those in mind. Um, this is an early version of a demo that will be tonight. And I just have to drag these over there. All right, so in this window, we just grab an image from the webcam, pretty simple. And we push it through a convolutional network. Oh, sorry, I just tried to get myself in the frame there. So we grab the image from the webcam, we push it through the convolutional network, and we just plot the activations directly. So in those two, those two edge detector positions I showed you before, we can see this left-right edge detector and right-left edge detector. OK, not, not too surprising. We can actually poke around in the different layers and see, see what we find. If we go all the way up to layer five, um, we find something, we find uh, many more abstract features are being, are being learned. In particular, if we look, uh, I can't see it. I think I'm too close. If we look uh, around the center bottom, sorry, I can't point on both, we find a unit that seems to learn to detect faces. And we can actually zoom in on that and I can't see, but maybe you can see. It should be probably kind of tracking my face as I move around. So this is pretty cool um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, it learned to detect faces without any single explicitly labeled face class in the ImageNet data set. Um, 
In fact, this, this unit is only learned en route to learning, to making other classification decisions. So it only provides useful context for other decisions. Uh, second, we can replace my image with an image I grabbed from the internet of a lion. And we find that this single unit is actually a face detector for multiple types of faces. So it doesn't just, well, presumably multiple types of, types of faces if I don't actually look very much like a lion. So it seems to be fairly broadly responsive, um, which definitely prompts, prompts further study. All right, back to the presentation. So if, you're, if you find that interesting, uh, stop by our demo, which will start at 7, uh, seven o'clock tonight. Um, all, of these, all of these methods of visualizing what's going on the inside of the network um, kind of prompt us to study further what's actually happening. They begin to paint a little bit of a picture um, where in the beginning of the network, uh, in the earlier layers, we're learning features that are fairly general. So these Gabor filters and color blobs, uh, like I said, apply to many tasks. It doesn't quite matter whether you're detecting faces of people or lions or cars. Gabor filters are, are good to have as first, the first layer of features. Another thing we can say is that by the time you get to the very last layer of one of these networks, we know that it's already specialized. So it, the very last layer has to be outputting a specific to a lion, outputting the lion class. And the question we're asking today and we're, we're going to study is, uh, what does this transition look like? Are things quite general for quite a long time and they specialize only at the end or maybe the opposite, they specialize early or, or something in between? Uh, so the main idea of this, this work is we're going to measure, we're going to quantify this transition from general to specific through the network uh, precisely by using transfer learning. Uh, so transfer learning is when we we train a network on one task, and then we use part of it for a second follow-up task, a target task. Um, so it's important to note that the calling things general or specific depends heavily on the pair of tasks that you choose. So you can't quite say some feature is general for all tasks. It makes more sense to say it's general in that it applies to a set of tasks, or specific in that it applies to one of a set of tasks and not the others. Finally. Uh, Knowing what's going on in these networks is very useful. Um, Alex and Ilya and Jeff's paper now has 900 sites. There's been a ton of follow-up work. A lot of people are training ImageNet networks, chopping them off somewhere in the beginning, and retraining something on the top, hoping that the features are fairly general. And to the extent that they've been successful, we've seen that the features are, in many cases, general enough. Uh, so uh, how do we set up the experiment? So we need to create tasks A and B. So we start with the ImageNet data set, which has 1,000 classes. And we randomly choose uh, subsets of 500 to split the data set into two halves. So in this case, we've stuck all the pandas into the A data set and all the elephants in the B data set and so on. We then create a convolutional network using the CAFE framework. And we create a network that's basically the same as in Alex's paper two years ago, except for uh, the last layer we have to shrink to have 500 output units. And then we train that whole network toward the A task. So now we have a network that can classify, hopefully, uh, 500 classes of, of objects. And we repeat this process for the B half. So now we have two separately trained networks, one for A, one for B. Uh, we call these networks base A and base B. So at this point, it's natural to ask, um, how, how well do these perform? Do they do pretty well, pretty poorly? Uh, okay, so we can take, the, take their uh, average accuracy on the validation set. I'm showing here top one accuracy. And uh, we can just plot them directly. So each point is the average accuracy of a single, single entire network over the whole validation set. Uh, we see some, some variance, uh, more or less 62 or 63 percent accuracy. There's some variance because of uh, different choices in the 500 classes and, of course, different random initializations. Okay, so now we wish to investigate this transfer performance. So what we're gonna do is we're going to take our uh, base A network, the network trained on the A half. We're going to chop it off, to keep only the first few layers, use them to initialize a new network. So we're gonna keep the first two layers, we're gonna freeze them, the rest of the layers are randomly initialized, and we're going to then train that toward the B data set. Now, why are we doing this? So. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take this network and compare its performance to the base B network. And the, the idea here is that 
if the feature learned through layer, in this case two, through the second layer, if that feature is general, then the performance of this transfer A and B network should be roughly the same as the base B network. On the other hand, if the first two layers were specific to dataset A, then we'll find that performance suffers quite a lot. So what do we find? So here's our base level performance. Uh, the first layer, what do we expect? We expect, well, we transferred some Gabor filters, probably things will perform the same. And in fact, we find exactly that. So performance does not suffer at all whether you learn Gabor filters from one data set or the other, they work, it works the same. Moving on up the layers, if we keep two layers from the base data set and learn only the remaining uh, six, then performance is about the same and the same for the third. Performance hasn't really dropped that much. As we transfer more and more layers, uh, performance drops more and more until we eventually get to the last layer. <clears throat> so a few things to note here. First, we knew the Gabor filters were fairly general. Now we can see that actually the first three layers are fairly general, not just the first one. Second, the drop in performance from the, very, from the base case of about 62% to the layer seven is only about 8% to 54% accuracy. So if I showed the whole plot going all the way down to zero, this would look you know, fairly impressive. Um, and the third thing we noticed is actually, we expected this sort of monotonic falling off of performance as the representation becomes more specific for one versus the other. But in fact, we see this really bothersome bump here. So why in the world, why in the world is that bump there? What causes that? So this kind of bothered us for a little while. We thought it was gonna be a straightforward study and then we figured we'd have to dig a little deeper. Um, so we dug deeper by training uh, some control networks. So the control networks we trained, uh, we started with a network trained completely for B, we chopped off the layers, kept those frozen, uh, initialized the new network, and then we did something kind of silly. And we trained this new network toward the original task, toward the B task, all right? The reason this is silly is because we already know how well the network can learn for B. It's that base level performance. And there's, we could see no reason why this network wouldn't just learn the same solution that was learned the first time. We even gave it a head start. We, we, we found the first two layers for it. Uh, by the way, we call these, uh, so the earlier networks were self -fer transfer networks. These we call self for networks. So starting at B, transferring at layer N to uh, target task B. So how well do these perform? Well. Turns out, they almost all perform as well as the base case, except for some curious ones in the middle of the network whose performance suffers. Uh, so we can make this a little more clear by just drawing lines through the means of everything and getting rid of the points. And uh, sort of a story starts to emerge here. So we find that performance drops for, for two reasons, kind of two separate reasons. Uh, first. Well, now we've, we've shown there's this sort of fragile co-adaptation and there's the specificity of the representation itself. So the fragile co-adaptation, what we think is happening is um, when the network is trained jointly, when all layers learn together toward the original task, it performs fairly well. So that's the base level performance. When we train, when we keep half the network and we discard the other half and then re really randomly initialize it and expect it to learn by itself, uh, a solution that kind of fits the earlier solution, but the earlier solution is not allowed to change, then it doesn't work as well. Uh, we have some interest, or I think they're interesting, uh, intuitions about why this might be the case, uh, but it, it'll take a little while to explain, so if you're curious, I, I'd ask you to come, come by the poster and we can maybe chat about it. Uh, finally, we can see uh, this representation specificity, which we can now think of as, so the, the penalty incurred by any networks on this red line are now comprised of two separate components. One is this, these lost co-adapted neurons that were found the first time, and the second is the representation specificity itself, which is actually the, the effect we set out to measure. So now, if we consider the specificity just to be the gap between these two lines, we can see in a more comforting way how this gap actually grows monotonically as we move from left to right. So we think this is the first time that people have, uh, have noticed both of these effects affecting transfer performance, and also we can notice that actually, depending on the, the layer you choose to transfer at, one effect or the other could dominate your, your drop in performance. So everything I've told you about so far it involves frozen features upon which uh, random, random layers were added and tuned, but the features were kept frozen. So this is a common case when you're training on, say, a large, 
data set like ImageNet, and then transferring to a much smaller data set. However, because our target data set is actually very large, half of ImageNet, we can also fine tune uh, fairly effectively. So we have fine tuned versions of these experiments as well, and we find that starting at this blue line, if we fine tune, um, we basically recover the base level of performance, which is sort of to be expected. So they couldn't, you couldn't relearn the solution by one half alone, but when they both learn together, it kind of works. Uh, and finally, when we fine tune the transfer version, we find something a little bit surprising. Uh, performance is actually better across the board. So we take this to be evidence that uh, transferred features plus fine tuning helps performance. This is not too surprising. This has been observed before, but we think it's a little surprising because in our case, the target data set is so large, half of ImageNet, that it already supports training the whole target network itself. And moreover, it actually takes uh, these networks train for nine days for 450,000 iterations. And so the fact that this performance is slightly better after nine days of training everything only on the target data set means that somehow the effects of having seen the first data set still linger after nine days of training, which we found a bit surprising. So um, <clears throat> what I've told you about so far involved this splitting of image N into two halves, the A and B half, each with 500 classes. Uh, we notice when we split things this way that actually we've created tasks A and B, a pair, that are almost as semantically similar as possible within ImageNet. So it's probably the case that in data set A you have something like fire truck, in data set B you have garbage truck. So maybe the features you learn for A, for the fire trucks, are useful for detecting the garbage trucks and so on. We thought it might be useful to actually create splits that are more, that are as different as possible. So what we did is we manually separated ImageNet into two halves. Uh, one half containing things that are man-made, one half containing natural, like for example, organisms. Um, and the split is actually almost, almost perfect. It just so happens ImageNet contains about half of each. So we want to compare transfer for this case to transfer for the case where uh, data sets are more similar. It's a, tr a little bit tricky because the base level of performance is different. Um, for example, the natural, classifying the natural images only it turns out to be a bit easier. Um, so what we do is we, to compare, we uh, subtract the base level of performance from each. So here we have the, the A and B curve from before, uh, just shifted to lie at zero, but then the percentage of performance uh, penalty is shown on the side. And on the same plot, if we show the dissimilar A and B, so the natural man-made, we can see that transfer performance is much worse. Um, we also, uh, for, just for completeness, I think, um, there's a study by Jarrett et al. in 2009 that showed uh, that actually random features are very useful. And so we tried to reproduce this work and found that in our case, uh, for maybe for the much larger ImageNet data set, random features couldn't quite compete with uh, learned features. Even learned features on, say, natural images transferred to man-made images. So uh, in conclusion, we've shown a few things. Uh, first, we've shown a way of measuring this general to specific transition layer to layer numerically. We've shown that transferability is governed by several effects. Uh, when not using fine tuning, it's governed by these lost co-adaptations and by the specificity of representation. And in different parts of the network, one could dominate or the other depending on where you transfer from. Finally, we've shown that transferability is also quite governed by the semantic distance between tasks A and B. So this is sort of intuitive. If you're transferring to a much less similar task, your performance will suffer. And finally, we showed that fine tuning helps even on very large target data sets. So in particular, if you have lots of data, probably just try to use all of it. So I'll remind you to stop by tonight if you'd like to the demo, and you can poke around with a convet and wave your hands and see if you find a hand detector. Uh, our poster is tomorrow night. I'd like to say thanks to my collaborators and funding agencies, and thanks to you guys for, for listening. We have time for a couple of questions. Before we do that, I would like to ask the presenters of the spotlight uh, to line up here on my left. Um, yes. So uh, in the AlexNet, you have the uh, convolutional layers and then the dense layers. So could you comment on how that affects the, the, your results? Uh, sure, sure. Um, so for all of our studies, we, we could transfer the convolutional layers and or the fully connected layers. The only layer where you would maybe run into a problem would be the very last layer where the number of output units would be different. And we never tried transferring, uh, even with fine tuning, all of the layers. 
I'm not sure if, if I'm answering your question. Yeah, so I just seem to remember some papers where I seem to remember that the, the dense layers are more prone to fit to the specific task than the convolutional layers are. Um, yep, yep. So I, I sort of expected that you would find almost like great transferability through all the convolutional layers, and then the fully connected layers would be much more specialized. Uh, in fact, we saw the fall off was a little more gradual. And it was further surprising that this co-adaptation problem seemed to occur between the convolutional layers. Um, I would have, so generally it seems like convolutional layers are very easy to learn because the number of parameters is small. I would have thought that freezing at layer four and relearning layer five, convolutional layer five would have been easy, but it seems like maybe, maybe it's not as easy as we hoped. May I ask Thank you a question about this? Is it due to the particular architecture that was split into columns or uh, do you think that this result extends to general architectures? So, so because it is split into columns and that layer was somewhat special, or? Uh, I don't know. It, it, th this result may uh, trend to transfer in a meta sense to many other types of networks, or it might not. I'm not really sure. Nando? Uh, yeah. the microphone, please. Where's the button? Yeah, in your. Oh, there. So um, keeping things simple, if you only have two parameters, like a very tiny network, and the joint of these is a U, uh, the, so the contours are like uh, U's, um, but imagine that it's a ramp going up with the mod at one end. So if you optimize both simultaneously, it's completely trivial to get to the optimum. But if once you get to the optimum, you cut it and you hold one variable fixed, and you, now you have a, an issue of local minima to optimize. So even if in a very simple network with one single unit and one latent variable, um, you cannot hold one layer fix and try to learn the other one. So I, I, I guess your result's very nice in the sense it's a lesson for everyone out there who thinks that, oh, we're just gonna use the pre-trained networks and... Well, okay, so to be fair, so I think your intuition is fairly good. We have a similar intuition, although it's hard to know how much of our intuition from living in a low-dimensional world would translate to a very high-dimensional space. Um, that said, I think the reason people transfer without fine-tuning is because they have to. So they, have this, they want a very large, powerful model. They want to stick only a very few number of parameters on top to transfer to a small data set. And like many of the hundreds of papers that have cited uh, Alex and company's paper in the last few years, uh, they've transferred to data sets that are too small to support much fine tuning. But in general, you're right. If you can, you should fine tune. And in fact, the practical rep recommendation, which you didn't need my talk for, is always try fine tuning and not fine tuning, because it's very simple to try both. Right? David, very quick. <laughs> the, this kind of beg for looking at what happened if you prematurely stop training ones, like when the basically the weights are much closer to the initial condition and the, the gradients are like, like it's a much better condition optimization problem. So yeah, rather than training a model all the way, you could like start adapting earlier and you would have a nicer uh, optimization surface. I'm sorry, you're saying stop that, starting adapting earlier in the base case or in the transfer case or? In the transfer case, so you, you go, you start from your network, you train it a bit on the first task and you move to the second task. I this see, way I you see. have a much yeah, better so condition exactly. problem. So it may be the case that a, a solution to fix this co-adaptation problem would be to like alternately train on your base task and your target task, which could allow you to keep a large network for both so you'd have a network that kind of splits and has a Y, and you train this one, train that one, train that one, train that one. That would allow you to support the, large, the size of the network through the large base task while also keeping the target task trained jointly. Yeah. Thank you. Last time, Jason again. Thank you.